Ahlan, that is how you say hello in the language spoken by many of the Moors who lived in northern Africa in the Middle Ages. In this lesson, we will design a sequential circuit following a Moor model. Specifically, this will be a vending machine that accepts both nickels and dimes. The design process will be identical to what we used in the previous video for a Mealy design, so this slide should look familiar. The only real distinguishing feature of the Moor model will first appear in the state diagram, and that small change will have ripple effects through the rest of the design. First, we need a task. Here, we are told to design a vending machine controller using a Moore model that will send the signal to vend a soda when enough money is deposited. As usual, this is too vague. What are some clarifying questions you would ask? My first question is, how many types of soda are in the machine? Our assumption will be just one, which simplifies things because we don't need our circuit to select a specific product. Second question, what is the cost of the soda? The answer is 15 cents. Third question, what types of coins will be accepted? We already stated that in the video intro, only nickels and dimes, no pennies, no quarters. Fourth question, does our circuit need to remember change? The assumption is no. So, if someone pays 20 cents and the cost is only 15 cents, well, they wasted 5 cents. Fifth question, can the user request money back? The answer is no. Once they start putting money in, they better be sure they actually want a soda. Last question, can more than one coin be deposited in any one time step? Just like in the previous design, we will assume no, which is a safe assumption with a high enough clock frequency. With the problem statement understood, we can move on to step one of the design process draw the state diagram. Here we see the beginnings of my state diagram, which identifies some important features. There are four states, one each for 0 cents, 5 cents, 10 cents, and 15 plus cents. That last state is what will make this a Moore design rather than a Mealy design like we saw previously. The soda cost is 15 cents. With a Mealy machine, we would not have a state that represents the final cost. We would have something like an arrow leaving 10 cents with an input of a nickel, which would drop the soda. But with a Moore machine, we have one Moore state. This last state represents that we have reached enough money with previous inputs. The little plus sign is important. It indicates that the state memory will not distinguish between 15 cents, 20 cents, or any higher. This is due to our assumption that the machine does not need to remember excess change. Another difference is that there are three arrows leaving each state. These arrows represent the three possibilities for depositing money on any one clock cycle. One possibility is that no coins are deposited, represented by input code 00. In this case, the state memory should remain right where it is. Another possibility is that a nickel is deposited with input code 01. In this case, 0 cents should move up to 5 cents. The last possibility is that a dime is deposited with input code 10. In this case, 0 cents should move up to 10 cents. Note that input code 11 is impossible because of our assumption that only one coin can enter at a time. With this foundation, pause the video and try to draw your own state diagram on the follow along worksheet. Here's my completed state diagram. Inspect it closely. I imagine you may have handled some of the arrows differently, especially with state D. But before we get there, let's look at the more typical nodes. Let's say the machine is at state B, or 5 cents. If we deposit no coins, we stay right there. If we deposit a nickel, we move up to state C. If we deposit a dime, we move up to state D. Nothing too surprising there. Starting at state C, if we deposit no coins, we stay there. If we deposit a nickel, we move up to state D. 
And now for a small surprise. If we deposit a dime, we also move up to state D. This is the reason for the plus sign within state D. Whether 15 or 20 cents are deposited, we will be at state D. Now for this final node. Recall the definition of state D. It means that we have deposited enough money in the past. Therefore, the soda should drop regardless of what the present inputs are. This is why I placed the star on the node itself rather than next to an arrow. Whenever we leave state D, by any route, the soda should drop. Now for the arrows. With no money deposited, the memory returns to zero cents. With a nickel deposited, the memory returns to five cents. And with a dime deposited, the memory returns to ten cents. These would be situations of a customer paying for one soda and then immediately starting to pay for another one. We spent a lot of time on the state diagram, and for good reason. This is where the real design work exists. All downstream steps are just converting this diagram into a functional circuit. Step two is to simply choose the flip-flop type. Here, arbitrarily, I'm choosing D flip-flops with this transition table we've grown to know and love. Step three is the next state table. I have it mostly complete here. Notice the same three broad sections up top, present state, next state, and required flip-flop inputs. Because there are only four states, I can use just two bits for the state codes. Sensibly, I decided to assign these codes in ascending order, 00 for A, 01 for B, 10 for C, and 11 for D. There are two columns of inputs, one for dime, one for nickel. Each state name is listed three times to cover the three arrows leaving each node. One row is for no money deposited, one row is for a nickel, and one row is for a dime. To obtain the next state name, I simply follow the state diagram. For example, when starting at B and depositing no coins, the memory stays at state B. But a nickel takes it to state C, and a dime takes it to state D. Once the next state names are entered, the next state codes are filled in, following the same naming convention, 00 for A, 01 for B, 10 for C, and 11 for D. This output Z column should only be high when leaving state D. So right now, all you see are zeros. Finally, the required flip-flop inputs are simple for this design because we are using D flip-flops. According to the transition table, the next state values will be whatever the present flip-flop instructions are. So, these columns end up being identical. D1 matches Q1 plus, and D0 matches Q0 plus. Now, you should be able to complete the table. Pause the video while you do. Here is the complete table. I have nothing much to add to my explanations except this. Notice how the output Z is high for every row that starts at state D. It doesn't matter what the current inputs are, only the current state. This is because we are designing this as a Moore machine. Now with the table complete, pause the video and try to derive the Boolean equations for D1, D0, and Z. Here's my KMAT for D1. Recall that these inputs come from the present state columns. Also, note this column of X's. That 1, 1 column represents cases where both a dime and nickel are deposited. We assumed that this was impossible, so these will be don't care conditions. A useful check for the KMAP is to realize that our next state table has 12 rows, but the KMAP has 16 squares. This means four squares must be don't care conditions. These same four squares will be X's on every K map in this design. For this K map, we obtain this equation for D1. In a similar fashion, here's the K map and the equation for D2. Note the same column of don't care conditions. Also note that this is a rather lengthy equation, 
which is partly because we are using D flip-flops. Finally, here's the K-map and equation for the output Z. There is a critical fact about this equation. It does not include the inputs D or N. Again, this is the definition of a Moore machine. The output signal is a function only of the present state and not of the present inputs. This slide is a recap of the design steps taken so far. No new information here, but I find it helpful to see all the steps on one screen, even if the text gets a little tiny. Those equations lead us straight to this final circuit. I've annotated all of the regions except for the state memory to reduce clutter. But the state memory is located in these two flip-flops in the middle, whose output signals are Q1 and Q0. This last flip-flop is not part of the state memory, but is just part of the output. This strobed flip-flop is actually less important than an Amelie design, because this output signal is already purely a function of flip-flop values, Q1 and Q0, and not input signals. So, even without it, the output would be held for one full clock cycle. However, the strobed flip-flop does ensure that the output is asserted after reaching state D, rather than at the moment of entering state D. This is a very small difference, but it's a useful habit to include an output flip-flop on any of your sequential circuit designs. There's not much more to say about the circuit, since the general structure is the same as our previous design. You certainly won't learn this layout by memorization, but instead by practice. In your assignments, you will have the opportunity of designing your own sequential circuits. Take advantage of slides like this as a template.